Okay, thank you so much for waiting, everyone. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Jen Shanger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, before I introduce them, just a couple of reminders for everyone that we are live on YouTube right now. Um, there are live captions um, at the moment. We will have them corrected in the next 48 hours, approximately. Um, and um, we would love to hear from you as we always do. So please just make sure that you're logged into your YouTube account if you would like to comment or feel comfortable telling us about yourself and where you're watching from. Um, we will be taking questions, so um, please feel free to ask them as you have them. And um, as Kate and Tara present, um, if there's any pertinent questions, we'll get to them then, and um, we'll have a period of Q&A at the end as well. Um, so to introduce our guests, uh, first we have Kate Jones, who is an autistic ADHD psychotherapist working with autistic clients. She's the chief communications officer for Neuroclastic, a disability justice advocate, illustrator and does formal and informal work to support disabled individuals and families. Then we have Tara Vance, who is a Melungeon of Romani and Native American heritage who grew up in a coal mining camp. She's autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, and apraxic. Vance was a secondary English teacher for 14 years and a DBT counselor for two before founding Neuroclastic, which is an autistic-led nonprofit. Um, and Joe, let's make sure that we put the link for Neuroclastic in the chat. Um, now Tara spends her days working various roles as Neuroclastic CEO. Her passions include decolonizing systemic structures, literature, especially Herman Melville's Moby Dick and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, building healthier communities, unpacking ancestry and reconnecting to her native cultures, all things plants and parenting her wonderfully autistic child. Um, thank you so much to both of you for being here. I can't wait to hear more on this topic and um, I will let you two take over now. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Tara Vance. Uh, I don't uh, present with the camera on because mutism. If I think you're looking at my eye contact, I will just not be able to speak. So, <laughs> so we make slideshows and you can see. Kate's lovely face. Uh, I'm Tara from Neuroclastic, and uh, thank you so much for having us, Jen. And uh, Kate, do you want to? Yeah, I'm Kate. It's really good to be here with you. Um, yeah, we did the intro, so I'm going to. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, Let's just get right into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, th today, we would love to make this informal and to have you ask any questions that are on your mind. It's very likely that lots of autistic people are going to be uh, in the chat who can also answer your questions um, because we just have a, an amazing audience and, and community. So, uh, but we will answer your questions as they come up, just drop them in the chat and Let's make this a brave space, not a safe space, so that you can find the answers that you need. One of the most uh, pressing questions, and you can move the slideshow, Kate, if you want, that parents have, as soon as their child is diagnosed, is what now? And, and it becomes this era in your life that you will never forget. And it, it is a critical period for you. You now have some answers and some confirmation uh, that you knew your child was different. And there is so much conflicting information. Before we say anything, you are your child. You know your child better than we do. We probably know autism better than you, but that, that doesn't mean that we are, you know, we can tell you exactly what is best for your child because all autistic people are very different. But we will try to give you a framework for thinking about what to do so that you can use, uh, use this to make a better decision. 
So when your child is diagnosed, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get, uh, you are likely <laughs> to have lots of therapies recommended for your child. You want to move that forward, Kate? And um, the first, <laughs> they're going to tell you OT, ABA, maybe physical therapy, um, speech and language therapy often. Uh, if your child is very young, even, you know, before two, it's possible that they will try and put your child in speech therapy um, for language delays. And we just want to give you a different way to think about your child and so that you can understand autism outside of what you hear from service provider professionals. I'm going to move that forward. I want to take this one. <laughs> sure. Um... Well, like it says on the on the slide, the world aggressively pushes therapies on autistic kids, um, and that's because we're we're taught as professionals. Um, I was um, about how children develop and at, at what pace and what milestones should be achieved when and what normal is, um, but that's only normal in a sort of in um, the in a neuro in neuro majority and even then it's it's there's no real right way to be so if your kid is 18 months old and not speaking it's likely they'll be referred to intensive speech and behavior therapies now i realize that i'm i'm coming at you from the uk and Terra is in the states and there's going to be differences um between how uh how autism is, is approached and dealt with in our in our countries and also elsewhere in the world but generally speaking if the milestone of no, no speech by eight, 18 months to two years is not met, then speech and language will be referred. Um, does your child toe walk or double you sit? So walking on their tippy toes or sitting kind of like cross with their knees underneath them and their legs out to the sides and their bum on the floor, that's double you sitting. So if so, your child will be referred to occupational or physical therapy. And does your child- Hey, can you just turn up so I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you turn your volume up a little bit? I think people are having trouble hearing you. Um, yeah, I. this is kind of what I've got. Okay. Can you hear me? I can change my microphone if I need to. I'll take it and you try and get your other mic and come back. <laughs> but you'll still have to advance the slides for me. And, you know, if your child has big emotions, meltdowns, then they're going to tell you behavior therapy. And um, there are no two-year-olds hardly that don't have big emotions, but uh, especially if it's your first child, um, some things that might be totally normal for a child are... Uh, pathologized because you now have that label. So there are a lot of things that you will start to become hypervigilant about, oh, that's autism. And if it's autistic, then that's a thing. You got to talk about it. And then they make goals about it. And um, we do not want to tell you not to do any intervention therapies um, because sometimes you need them and, and parents need help and children Often autistic children have medical co-occurring conditions uh, like Ehlers-Danlos or other connective tissue disorders. I know some people pronounce that differently, but uh, EDS, hypermobility. Um, but there's going to be this frantic urgency. They're going to tell you, if you don't do these therapies up to 40 hours a week, your child's going to be ruined. Um, but your child will never be independent. Your child will never drive. Your child will never graduate from school. As a parent, I heard all of these things about my own child before she even turned two years old and that she was severely intellectually disabled. 
I did not use the word Asperger's when I told them that both uh, myself and my husband were autistic. They said to me, and I quote, your child does not have your and your husband's Asperger's. This is classic severe autism. That is what professionals told me. Your child is not like you. You have to do these therapies. So it put us in the position of instant, you're neglectful parents if you don't do this. Uh, and especially having an autism diagnosis, you start to worry that professionals will target you as being um, poor parents. <laughs> and so uh, you worry about child protective services. And that is a thing that happens. And when you have autistic kids with connective tissue disorders, uh, they get bruises easily. And, you know, autistic kids can be clumsy. You start to worry so much if they get a bruise from falling because they bruise easily or you start to think all the time, like somebody is going to think I'm not a good parent. Your child acts very different in public and people stare and you think everybody's going to think I'm a bad parent. And if you are a parent of an autistic child, this is probably very relatable to you at like a visceral soul level that you have carried that, that social fear. And so we need to talk about why this urgency happens, what autism really means, and how can we think about an approach? Uh, I was told to put my child in four therapy, five actually, feeding therapy, speech therapy, OT, PT, ABA. And I did do an hour every two weeks of OT for a few months, and that's it. Um, and a couple, an hour every two weeks of speech for a few months, and that's it. And I'll tell you why and how that turned out. Kate, did your mic, did you yeah. get it? Was here. Know. Can people hear me a little better now? Yes, you sound yeah. better now. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'll give it now. to you. <laughs> Wait, these are yeah. bad ideas uh, that because we live in a very capitalistic system. Everything that has any kind of urgency to it has a bit of um, advertising in it or a lot of advertising because these are industries that need you to be their clients so that they can continue to stay in business. So a lot of it is commercialism and uh, there are a lot of things that have been highly popular before, and we put a few in here just, just to show that uh, things that were socially normal and everywhere might have not always been great. I'm going to take that, Kate. Next few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean a lot of things that were considered that were considered all right in the past uh, we we kind of broadly understand to not be okay now because we've had a paradigm shift we've changed the lens through which we view things we know that uh smoking isn't good for people's health and therefore in hospitals and schools having any kind of room where everyone gets together in large numbers and fills it full of smoke's a bad idea um yeah, so, sorry, I'm having a brain freeze, Tara. <laughs> it's okay. Go ahead and move it to the next one. These are short. Uh, these are just meant yeah, yeah. to be breezed through. Tanning oh. salons and strip malls everywhere. Uh, ubiquitous white male leadership in all things. Um, just we change as society as we get better information. And so, Kate, I'm going to give you a minute to recover <laughs> from the mic thing, and you just cut me off when you're ready to jump back in. Sound good? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, things um, become the gold standard, not because they are always 100% of the time the best. 
a lot of times things that are popular and everyone's doing them or it's the norm it's just because uh advertising is better is more powerful than logic <laughs> uh and so the suppression of knowledge and understanding uh, happens more than actually helping you to understand your child. So the first thing is, if people are speaking to your emotions and sounding alarms and fear mongering, you need and and also offering you like some kind of miraculous hope. That's a commercial, okay? That's not that's an advertisement and and maybe not science. If they say gold standard or, you know, the most accepted, that does not always mean that it is the best thing. That it, and this is not to say that you should never do a therapy again. It's just to say, be critical and analyze uh, before you make decisions that could have, um, permanent impact on your child. And we'll talk about the impacts in a second. Go ahead and move it forward. So we uh, work with neuroscientists and we're gonna really simplify the neuroscience to like cartoon level. And it's oversimplified, but it's accurate. Um, and we have some really exciting neuroscience coming up in the near future. We've been we've been working with some amazing people who who have some technology to actually watch autistic brains as we do different tasks, so they can show exactly how each autistic person is different, and that will help us to to know exactly what each autistic person needs and why they need it. And then we can target therapies so that they're and accommodations so that they are suited to the autistic individual because we're all different. And I'll show you how. Move that forward. Oh, let's go to a little video. <laughs> Any questions so far? Um, yeah, someone's asking whether our slideshow will be available after. A presentation. Can we oh, make yeah, it we can, yeah, we can yeah. totally put a, a link to the slideshow in the chat. Yeah. Also, I'll put the link for the article about this topic in the chat as well so that people have that too. Yeah, we have an article called It's Not Autism on Neuroclastic that, uh, that will go in a little more depth with some of this. Uh, you can read as well. Okay, go ahead and move this forward. I can't wait to talk okay. about brains. So Kate right. drew so this. this. Is, oh, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so this is kind of the, the most common kind of brain, right? The neurotypical brain, where all the functions that we need to perceive sensory information um, are connected in our brain by roots that are of the same kind of, of connection so there's a if you think about them like a, a map and a road all the roads are kind of of equal size and and the the messages that flow in and out of our brains like in and out of our brains in our brains um are doing so pretty pretty neatly it's quite um evenly connected and then in an autistic brain those connections are not all the same. So we have unevenly wired brains. Um, we have hyperconnected areas and hyperconnected areas. So some lanes are like the eight lane highway that, and there's a particular sense of function that we have just excellent access to. And some are like really um, like dirt tracks with um, obstacle courses and, <laughs> and streams to jump over before we can really access a, a sense properly. Um, and so we are working all the time to um, make sense of our world and and go about living our lives. It's Everyone like doing it's like doing one of those hardcore wilderness obstacle courses to do some things that people do every day that are just 
totally easy to them, like running an errand or cooking a meal or whatever, because parts of their brains don't communicate with each other or they take a really circumspect uh, path. And there are a lot of deaf and blind autistics because of this uh, low connectivity. But for autistics who aren't deaf or blind, they may not realize that they have severe hypo or under connectivity to the sense of hearing or the sense of vision. And um, they, th that's where you get your visual and your auditory processing disorders, uh, which I have uh, severe auditory processing uh, disorder. Did not know that until recently. Never been able to hear, had to drop tons of classes and change my major in college multiple times because I could not understand a single word some professor said. So I didn't want to become a teacher, but like I couldn't, you know, the majors that I was in, there were just some professors uh, that taught certain classes and I couldn't understand them at all. It was like they were Charlie Brown's teacher. I could hear everything, but I can't always understand each person's voice. Uh, there's technology that helps me a lot at this age, but I didn't have access to that before because I didn't know that I had that issue, <laughs> that processing deficit. I graduated as valedictorian from high school, but I couldn't read until fifth grade um, and was believed to be severely, uh, you know, have severe intellectual deficits. And I do have some areas of intellectual uh, disability because my visual and spatial understanding are extremely poor, but, um, and I'm dyslexic. So <laughs> once we understand these things, we start to put accommodations in place that uh, make things easier. Large text is all I needed. As soon as I got, I, I found a novel that had large text for a book report. And I chose that one because it had fewer words per page. But it was like instant, finally I could read. And that's the problem the whole time. My eyes, uh, because of dyspraxia, my eyes couldn't track small print. I was just getting lost. It was like a blur of letters. And gradually, once I got good at eye tracking with large print, I was able to step it down. And I did this with all of my students uh, for 14 years as an English teacher. And I also use audiobooks. And my kids did amazing. I always got accused of like some kind of cheating because my kids' test scores would improve so much. But it was just that I, even though I didn't understand all of this at the time, I knew what had worked for me and I tried it for them and it, and it largely did work for them. And so uh, it was different. But now that you see how autistic brains can be so differently dispersed <laughs> neurologically, how our resources can be so I don't wanna say unbalanced because for me, this is the brain that I was born with. It is not, it's unbalanced compared to yours probably. Even if you are autistic, we all have very different distribution of resources within autistic people. Uh, so you may have great visual processing and be an amazing artist and that's just not me. <laughs> and so, um, and there are some autistic people who are amazing coordinated athletes. And that's not most of us. <laughs> most of us are kind of clumsy because of um, motor planning deficits, but we are all different and uh, in, in how our resources are distributed compared to most people and to each other. I, you can move that forward. That was my favorite yeah, I was just part. thinking about how the school system, <laughs> how the school system kind of um, is set up for a particular kind of brain. So both you and I were considered to 
be um, not that smart for a lot of our school lives, right? And for me, I didn't really understand until I was doing my postgraduate education that I just needed to process information visually. Um, so as soon as I realized that when I, when I drew as I was listening, I could retain so much more information, I could understand information. And if I drew it, I could arrange it in a way that it made sense to my, my brain and then I could remember it. Um, and also I have dysphantasia, which means I really struggle to hold images in my head. So uh, I make sense of things visually, but I can't hold those images in my head. So I'm compelled to draw them down, like draw them on a piece of paper. Um, apparently that's really common. Loads of people who work for Pixar, right? incredible anim animators are aphantasic or dysphantasic. So have some degree of not being able to hold the image of something in their mind. Um, I didn't, I didn't know that that wasn't how everyone was. Like, I didn't know that other people could just remember somebody from their life and have a pic, have an image of them in their head. That's, that's wild to me. That's like some pretty neat trick. Um, so as soon as I realized that I could listen and draw at the same time, so I could regulate my attention and I could have bilateral communication, bilateral movement in my body that would help the left and right hemispheres of my brain communicate with one another. Um, my ability to take on information and understand and um, synthesize was it was a, it was a game changer. But I was in my thirties and doing my postgrad. By the time I realised I wasn't stupid, that I was just I had an autistic brain. So yeah, and okay, same. <laughs> yeah, I mean we both have this very similar stories, and most autistic people do. And they call us late bloomers. And there's a reason for that. We are not lagging. Um, you're going to have everyone tell you that your child is lagging in certain skills. And what skills those are are going to be different from child to child. So you may have a really early uh, speaking, early talker. And you might think your child is super genius uh, because of that. And then later they struggle a lot in school and you think they're just lazy because you've got this brilliant child who could speak so early and, or it could be the opposite. And you might have this. And when I say brilliant, um, like I said, people don't have more or less more or fewer neural resources. They're distributed differently. Okay. So if you have 100, you know, um, units, <laughs> you might have 80 of those in one sense and be amazing at it and very little to distribute around, or it could be like perfectly evenly spread. But we imagine that we all have about 100 units, <laughs> give or take. And, it, you know, even if you get a traumatic brain injury, your brain's going to still use the same amount of neural resources, they're going to reroute and change how your brain works. And so if you get a traumatic brain injury, you might develop some amazing skills that you didn't have before. And that's happened before. They've had people who are tone deaf, literally uh, a music or can't perceive sound, have a traumatic brain injury and then become musicians and be amazing. <laughs> and so it's just Resources different. So it's not lagging. Your child is on a totally different trajectory. All the things that you see about what your child should be doing at a certain age, 100% of them are based on the average, right? The average child with the typical brain, what most kids do. Your child's brain's not typical though. So you don't know their trajectory. You don't know what they're supposed to be doing at a certain time. When we look at these, you know, parents get these emails and apps that say, you know, your, your baby is 18 months, they should be saying three word sentences and pointing and laughing at your jokes and this and that. Your child might do those things much later or much earlier because their brain just has a different trajectory. It's prioritizing different skills at different times is literally not wired the same way. It's not structured the same way as the ones, as the brains that those checklists were designed to mimic. So you don't have to worry 
so much uh, that your child is not behind and doesn't need to catch up by default. Your child may have some issues that need intervention, like if their motor coordination is so poor or their muscle tone that they can't sit up or, or walk or be ambulatory, or they have difficulty swallowing, those things are kind of an emergency. Uh, you need your child to be strong enough to sit up. Uh, if your child's not eating at all and they're at risk of a feeding tube, that's when things get scary because uh, feeding therapies often traumatize kids and make things worse. So you have to be really careful. We're going to help you with some resources to know uh, what is good therapy and what's not. You can move that forward. Any questions? <laughs> might just need Michael to catch up a little bit because I know there's a delay. So uh, Christine Fried said, can you spell those two words you described yourself as? And then Kate, you answered aphantasia and dysphantasia. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that was my two words, so. <laughs> Christine, if those aren't the two words, let us know and we'll yeah. um, ask them to clarify. Um, earlier on, there was a question that maybe you guys will wait a little while to answer, but I took note of it. Um, Oh, wait, let me. Oh, okay, here's one from Noblehart. Do you feel that social fear will sometimes make parents processing trauma become more focused on defending their image and reputation than they are concerned about working with their child? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And some of that is like a parent needs to work on themselves and, and understand. And that's not to say, that's not to blame you because we all, I mean, most of us have generational trauma. And if you have an autistic child, it's very likely that you or your spouse or one of your parents are autistic. And no matter how wonderful you are of a person, if you're in a mixed neurotype family, there's going to be a whole lot of just misunderstanding. And my teachers in school and Kate's, we could tell you so many horror stories they didn't understand us. Their parents didn't know, wouldn't have this information in the 80s. So, you know, we've experienced what it's like when parents uh, and more from that generation of children should be seen, not heard to. Yeah. Uh, but yes, parents absolutely have those fears. And some of it is not because you know, the parent needs to do some work on themselves, but they're worried about their children's safety, being bullied, especially if you're not white in a white dominant society. Um, and especially if you're black in America and, and a lot of places, there's a whole lot of anti-blackness and what is seen as cute or quirky or just annoying and white autistic children can be seen as a threat and dangerous and black autistic children and native autistic children. And they don't get the same kind of patience. And so parents, yes, they do often let social pressure cause them to make a lot of parenting mistakes. Sometimes it is, uh, but that we're not trying to blame anyone for that uh, because sometimes you don't want to parent a certain way. You don't you don't care if your kid is making that noise or, you know, doing something that other people think is weird. It doesn't bother you, but you're afraid that it's going to make them a target. It's going mm -hmm. to get them bullied on the playground or whatever. And so some of it is just, you know, it's parental love. It's very hard to know. Even I have an extremely hard time making decisions sometimes like, what should I stop? What should I try and redirect? My child is so sensitive that no amount of gentleness, if she feels that she's done something wrong, it, she'll, she'll repeat, I'm bad. I've never once said bad about a person in front of her, and especially not her. But she'll just keep saying, I'm bad, I'm bad, over and over for days. If I'm just like, you know, you need to be careful because you could fall down the stairs when you when you put the hamper on your head and walk past. Um, 
because that, that used to be a thing. <laughs> we had one of those little fabric hampers that she used to love to, because it, it surrounded her, it made her feel safe, but then she would walk past the stairwell. So it, it just upset her so much. So it's really hard because depending on how your child is, or your child just might not remember anything. <laughs> My husband is the autistic person with very poor memory and I'm the opposite um, because that's just how autistics are. And he, uh, you have to tell him the same thing every day because he just doesn't remember. So every autistic person is different. It's really hard and you just have to do your best. And we're going to give you some tools to help you feel better about that and maybe have a better best than your current one. You can move that forward. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, Tara? Sure. Okay. So, um, my rad fam asked typically the milestones that are measured for child development help inform when attention is needed. Have you all thought about collaborating with the American Medical Association on developing some modifications to the milestones timeline for a neurodivergent individual? We would love to do that. And we have great. talked about um, like creating your own, like I said, every autistic brain is different. So there is no, you know, yeah. Albert Einstein Tesla and Herman Melville, who's my favorite author ever, uh, and and Ralph Ellison, who wrote Invisible Man, his other favorite author, they all did not speak until they were four um, and were believed to be severely intellectually disabled as young children. Herman Melville, uh, who wrote Moby Dick, couldn't read until he was 12 or no, it was older. He was an adult and he just couldn't, he never read a book, but then he found a large print book of Shakespeare and that just, and, and then he became the greatest, <laughs> in my opinion, the greatest writer of all time. So, um, you know, it, some of it is just, it, it's not that the child is underperforming, it's that they're under accommodated. But we have talked about that and we would love to collaborate. Uh, we're just kind of new and still. Yeah. Plus the problem um, is I guess that. I'm sorry, Kate. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I have... You're good. Okay. I'll just say one of the issues is that, um, like you said about the like divvying up of resources, these like milestone lists that are made and the, um, observational uh, view of what so-called deficits a person has, um, they miss everything that the person does. And so there's not, there's not really one, like you said, there's not really one um, specific way of development, but there's also no objective way to really see what that what that child is developing into and, and, you know, what their nervous system is doing, what work around their nervous system has developed. And so in a lot of ways, these lists are really not helpful at all because um, no one person is going to be exactly the same. And, you know, if someone is speaking it too, they may have other areas that are a little weaker, or if they're not speaking, they may have areas that are much stronger. And no test that has yet been developed does any justice to any of the, you know, the amazing workarounds that every single system has done. So um, I know that there was an updated list that came out recently, and I think especially certain therapists had a lot to say about that, but in many ways, those lists do more to scare people into getting services that they think they need that may or may not actually be helpful. Um, and we'll get into this later, but part of what I just wanted to add to what you're all saying is that intervention is always sold to families as it's inherently good. And that is not true because intervention is inherently intrusive and there's not a solid um, research base um, in most of these things, especially in the things that are considered gold standard like ABA. 
Um, and so just as there is potential for good, there is also potential for harm. One thing and that's the part that no one tells us, no one says, you know, this could have detrimental effects too. Um, go ahead, Tara. Oh, I, you were hitting on the point that I was about to, to say, um, if your child is deaf and you don't know it, and Kate uh, has, it, like with my visual processing and Kate's auditory, uh, Kate's deaf, um, it, it's very likely that you may think that they're intellectually disabled. If your child can't speak, they can't demonstrate right. what they're amazing at. If they have very poor motor control, and there are multiple reasons that a person can't speak, but it's usually with autistic people motor and, and just having difficulty. You need six different parts of your brain to work together to make speech happen. You gotta pull words out of your memory and, and images. You gotta sequence them. You gotta make your mouth move. And you know, when you see people have a stroke and they develop aphasia, and they say things that make no sense to people or um, mm -hmm. that means their brain's going to work around and we got to accommodate it. That doesn't mean that they have lost who they are, that they're less. Uh, just means we got to do things differently and move this life forward because we we have this covered <laughs> in, in a little bit. We're okay. building to that. And there are other questions. But I'll wait until we move a little further. So just to anybody who asked, I promise that we'll get to you, but I'm just going to let them go to the next part and then we'll come back. So this analogy series um, is here and hopefully you'll look at this and it will burn into your brain and you'll think about these houses and these homes when you think of your child. This picture is meant to be how an illustration of how most brains are. They might have different color shingles on the roof. They might be painted different colors, but they're largely the same. They largely have a kitchen and a bathroom or two and a couple bedrooms, a garage, right? And maybe different shrubs planted out front, but they're None of these houses that you look at are, are like, whoa, that's totally doesn't fit here. It's different, it's wrong. And none of them are gonna upset a homeowner's association. I'm gonna move that forward. I'm gonna take the next one, Kate. Yeah, but autistic <laughs> brains are different. And they don't look like those kind of um, homogenous houses. They're we have we're wired for specialism so some brains look like a yurt <laughs> and think about what this brain compared uh, to a row house might be different how a person might be different like sorry i think we got a lag my mm -hmm. bad oh my yeah are we back on track I... your mic's okay. cutting some can you hear me Yes. Okay. Yeah. So some, some are like an RV, but it's still home, right? It's, is it broken for having four wheels? Does it have the same features and functions as a row house? Can you live in it? Can you be happy? Right. And if you get angry that that RV has wheels, because most houses don't, you've destroyed the function of the, <laughs> the design of it. Um, this will be my brain. That's a warehouse. There's no bedroom. This is totally my brain. There's no bathroom. <laughs> There's nothing. There's no seating. It's just a bunch of storage and then just vast memory for no good reason all the time. I, I, I'm just all useless facts <laughs> and sometimes useful facts, but I'm not practical as a human at all. Uh, the way most people are. And I was never okay with that. Somewhere like a Romani Vardo. I had to put this in here. It wasn't originally, but um, it was my uh, heritage. And so it's thinking about this. What 
why do Romani need mobile homes like this? Um, when you're not allowed to work in a country, you, you can't afford gasoline, but your horses can eat the grass. And Romani don't have a homeland. They borrow um, and give back to the earth. And so but this kind of home supports the livelihood and health and culture of our community. And it's important, not every Romani lives. I don't, I, I need a whole house and air conditioning, but you know, <laughs> a lot of people do. Um, and that supports their culture and it's not, is it wrong? That's the only thing they have and it's beautiful for them. Uh, okay, now if it's we have accepted. <laughs> yeah, now we have your kid. This is my child. Yes, my child is a water bounce castle. There's no seating. It's all whimsy <laughs> and movement and joy and vivid colors. And it's not practical, but I'm not willing to tone down my child's colors or deflate any part of her for the, for the comfort of the homeowners association. I feel an immense pressure to, for her safety, not because I need her to be different. I love everything about her. She is very different. And I, I I'm homeschooling because I, as, as the founder of the world's, you know, largest traffic, um, probably most visible autistic organization, we get a lot of correspondence every day from parents experiencing tragedy with their children being arrested in school for echolalia. We, um, we got pardons for some autistics who were imprisoned for things like echolalia. We had someone repeat something someone said to them, just echo it because autistics do that. When they're help, it helps them to process what they hear when they're overwhelmed. And they took that as a confession and sentenced him to 50 years. When they said, were you trying to kill yourself? He repeated that. And they said it was a confession because he had a seizure and drove into traffic. And so uh, there was a child who got accused of trying to be a school shooter and he's non-speaking. He echoes, but he doesn't have, he doesn't have spontaneous speech. And he repeated that and he had, he's, he was incarcerated in a jail, a seventh grader, non-speaker for two weeks. And I can't, my, one of her board members' children was killed. I can't send my child to school. So I'm saying that, I'm letting you know that this is, none of this is meant to judge you or make you feel guilty because there are very real dangers and you do have to worry but I still made the decision not to do all those interventions. And, and we'll talk about why I keep going, Kate. You wanna take that one? I need a minute to recover from thinking about all that. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that, I know we were talking about the immense pressure that parents are under. And I think we also need to address that. Many of the parents that are under immense pressure to put their children into therapies and have them conform for safety are also neurodivergent and traumatized by their own experience of being neurodivergent and masking and being traumatized by the environments they, they grew up and were educated in. And so we can love our kids as they are and still and and still be overwhelmed by the pressure to engage in the systems in in the ways that we're expected to by the neuro majority. Um, and that's just how the oppression of being um, autistic or neurodivergent just continues and gets, gets passed on. Anyway, uh, oh, should we just, yeah. So we don't have a blueprint for autistic development. I think that's what we're, we're driving at. There isn't a right way or a wrong way. Every child is wired differently, but every child autistic or not has a developmental blueprint. An early intervention by nature is an attempt to change the structure of that development after the blueprints are drawn. You know your children, like so often parents 
have a wisdom about their children that they're spoken, that they're, they're talked out of, and they have to fight against a system to try and um, prevent the trauma that they know is being caused. And no one's really validating that. If anything, the opposite is happening. Parents are being gaslit by um, providers of therapies like ABA, which is a trillion dollar industry, to engage in something they know at their core is harmful. Um, and we're not so I, yeah, go on. And we're not here to say that um, I personally do not uh, believe that while we know that there are some ABA, not a lot, but there are some who listen to autistic people who are committed to doing the right thing. And we know that there are, there are people who are making just huge efforts to fix things, both advocates who have nothing to do with ABA, who are working and trying to change the system. There are 50 states that have tons of laws in each state that would have to be revoked to ban ABA um, and to stop insurance from providing it. And so, and just seeing there were, I think 10,000 plus RBTs, uh, new RBT, no, 10,000 plus new BCBAs uh, in America last year. So this is not going away anytime soon. So we just want, while I personally do not recommend ABA therapy, we're not, again, trying to judge anyone. Um, but when you address only behavior without understanding neurology, and they are specifically taught to only look at behavior and not neurology, that neurology doesn't matter, would it matter if you treated a cat like a dog? Would it matter if you treated a deaf person like they could hear? Would it matter if you're, and you know, a lot of things that we get told are autism uh, and we're learning now are actually autoimmune conditions like um, autoimmune encephalitis, inflammatory conditions that are causing inflammation around your kid's brain. So your kid suddenly has this dramatic behavioral change and they're totally different and they're suffering. And they're saying, this is normal autism. And they put them in a behavior therapy and try to change the behavior when they need medical attention. And so it's very hard and you need a network of a lot of people. You need a community to help you make these decisions. And that's very important and something we're trying to to help give you uh, so that you can make the, the best decisions. So if you intervene, a lot of autistic kids do not develop the neurology and the internal sensory uh, indicators that they need to use the restroom. Some don't ever, there are tons of autistic adults in neuroclassic who wear uh, incontinence products like um, poise pads, uh, or, pull-ups, uh, disposable underwear for adults every day and they have degrees and they go to work or they don't have degrees and go to work. It doesn't matter. A lot of people just don't develop the internal sensation that they need to use the bathroom or they can't develop the sensation that they need to pee. That's why you don't try to potty train a six-month-old, right? They're not developmentally ready for that. So when you're trying to force a two-year-old or three-year-old to change and sit on a toilet with a stranger while they're screaming and the stranger's telling you, don't get your child up off the potty. You don't reinforce this bad behavior. Uh, they, they're just playing you. No, that child is trying to communicate that they can't. And you're just forcing them to, to undress in front of a stranger that it's totally normal in their most formative developmental years for a stranger to take their clothes off and put them on the toilet and force them to stay there. And that might, that's going to traumatize your child, especially if they're not developmentally ready. Just wait a little while. Um, it's okay if your child 
needs incontinence products for a little longer. There are programs in, in the United States that will send you free um, incontinence products, free diapers and pull-ups uh, for older children. And yeah, so imagine how traumatic that would be. I had that. I, it took me a very long time and I had so much shame and my parents thought that I was just lazy and wouldn't go. Um, so a few times in kindergarten, I would go outside and fall, uh, pretend to trip into a mud puddle so that I could get wet and have to go home and change um, because I had had an accident. But I was so scared to get in trouble and be shamed for being lazy, but I just couldn't, I couldn't feel it. I still have a really hard time. It's like not until it's an emergency do I know. So I, I set timers for myself, but it's always been that way for me. And that uh, I'm not ashamed of that now, but I used to be because I didn't know I was autistic and I didn't, I, I thought that I was lazy and just bad at being a human. So it would have helped me a lot for somebody to say, hey, you can't do this right now because your nervous system is different. Here's what we can do to help. And so, yeah, just thinking about things this way. As an adult, having been a child like my child, I'm making decisions that I wish had been made for me, that my parents might have made had they had the information that I have. So I have privilege that my parents didn't have. Um, yeah, <laughs> you want to move that on? You can take that one. So we begin to realize that our children are autistic because they're missing milestones on a standard developmental timeline. This is a reflection of society's intolerance for difference and love of gold standards, even of humanity. So we recognize our children are autistic because they are not something rather than because they are something. And when, when you're focusing on speech, and you have that child who's going to speak when they're four, because that's when their brain is wired to develop that. Then you look for other ways to help them communicate. They might never speak, and that also is okay. You look for other ways. But if you are constantly <laughs> focusing on communication um, at all times because your child is slightly delayed, and I'm not saying let your child go forever with having no communication. Please don't take this to an extreme, I'm saying to be critical and think about maybe your child's not delayed. They're just not ready yet. Um, they're not a late bloomer. They just are doing other things. Their brains are wired. Most brains do the same thing at the same time because they're wired similarly. Your child's not, and that's okay. Um, if you focus on that, then the skills that their brains are wired to prioritize are not getting the attention they need. And I'm going to give you an example that's very concrete. My daughter, who was who I was told was severely intellectually disabled, uh, she didn't speak. Um, they, uh, she, I knew she could read before she could speak, and they thought that I was crazy. They were like, all parents think their kids can do these things. As soon as she could speak, she was reading. She was, point, I would say, point at X word, and she would point at it. My child had the periodic table of elements memorized at age three. I didn't teach her how to read. She just learned from watching me read to her every night. I just treated her like... Um, you know, I always wanted to read books to a child. I'm an English teacher, right? So I just treated her the way that I thought. My child can't read small print either. She she likes board books because they have big print. But she she can read. She could read this slide at age five. She's five now. She could read this slide easily. Um, there are a lot of things she can't do that other kids can. She still doesn't have the motor control or dress independently. She only started potty training at five and she can now, but she couldn't until five, but I didn't focus on it. Didn't worry about it. I would try every couple months. Wasn't ready. Okay. That's okay. We'll try again a little later. And so, but now it's fine. I don't have any reason to worry. Everything turned out fine. Um, 
my child still has things that are quote deficit compared to most kids. She has things that are better, not better, but you know, more advanced developmentally um, skills from other kids. And that's fine too. That doesn't make her better or worse in any way. It's just the person she is. She's not a row house. She's a bounce castle Um, and that's okay. So imagine if I took most two-year-olds and put them in intensive reading interventions because my child can read. Your child should too at age two. Would that traumatize that child? Would that stunt their development? Absolutely it would. That's why we don't try to give kindergartners uh, trigonometry, it's not appropriate developmentally for them. And um, and so we need to think about what, we don't know what's appropriate developmentally for our children. And sometimes waiting if it's not an emergency is the wisest thing to do because trauma prevention should be your number one goal. And you move that forward. Yeah, and I'm seconding that really because I work a lot with um, young people who've been traumatized by the school system, particularly PDAs. I mean, I know people in the chat were asking if we would speak to PDA. Trauma is so much easier to prevent than it is to heal. And if we yes, if we just know and we do that, forcing kids to um, engage in an education system that's that's traumatizing them, we could stop. I mean, it's a privilege to be able to stop. I mean, uh, there's no blame on parents here, but the system, the system really fails neurodivergent kids and particularly PDAs. And um, every child has developmental leaps at certain times and they lose skills. Your, your non-autistic neurotypically developing child probably did gain skills and lose them. They probably stopped speaking after they started for a little while and then started back where they got really good at something and then they stopped doing it all together for a while and then picked it back up later. That's what kids do. And that's totally normal. Autistic kids might have more, much more extreme leaps, right? Cause we know that we have a lot more neuroplasticity Our brains rearrange a lot quicker. So we might seem to have quote a regression or this big giant leap where suddenly we couldn't do anything and now we do everything. And that's normal for autistic kids. So just letting you know that as an FYI. Yeah. <laughs> Leaps are high drama. They come with, um, you know, all kids have these at certain points and they have explosive, emotions and this is not just autistic kids their sleep patterns get messed up all kids do this but for autistic kids we don't know when to expect these things and because they lose or gain different skills we don't really know how to address those but just knowing that we can let go of the expectation of developing like most kids is so helpful (laughs) and not panicking and trying to fix it right now um, because it's okay. It's just different. It's not always harmful or in need of intervention. Let me move that if, if you don't have anything to add. <laughs> I'm gonna take that one. Yeah, so how do the leaps look when a child's in intensive therapy? Big mood is a behavior change so leaps are normal fits and meltdowns and sleep disturbances are normal but they will be therapized as bad behavior what skills are being built we don't have the blueprint for the autistic mind so we don't know what skills they're developing and when and um, regardless of neurotype all children need co-regulation and emotional support to become their best future selves so Co-regulation is, is one of the biggest the biggest needs for, for our neurodivergent young people, our autistic young people as well. And I don't think it's um, enough value is placed on just how, how important it is for parents to be able to, to sit with and co-regulate children. Like that's, that's almost like the biggest therapy that you can offer 
um, I don't know that I was ever told. Tell were you ever given that message at all, ever? No, I was told just to stop having a mood. I was to stop having emotions, you know. And, to, a, and then to ignore, like to ignore whatever tantrum is happening, big mood is happening when, when the absolute opposite is necessary. And this is a big reason why so many autistic adults have no connection to their bodies at all. I was asked my pronouns <laughs> before this started and I said I have no idea just call me whatever I don't feel a gender I don't I only learned this year that when people say they feel emotions in their body that they mean that literally I'm I'm a writer I write fiction I I have a novel (laughs) that's almost ready for publication and I write about feeling emotions in the body because I thought it was a metaphor everyone used, like a common language, but they really mean it. People literally feel sexual arousal in their genitals. People literally feel Uh nervousness in their stomach. I didn't know that. I thought- I remember when you discovered that. Yeah, I I couldn't believe that people actually felt their bodies. I don't. Uh, I've gone to work in sepsis and multiple organ failure because I have been conditioned my entire life to ignore my body and my needs. So I go to work with sepsis and multiple organ failure and doctors tell me it's not scientifically possible that you're alive right now. I've had 17 surgeries. Um, All all could have been avoided, uh, but I don't know my body because I've been taught since child early childhood that what i'm experiencing those sounds that hurt me are not real me saying that i can't understand people when they're talking is me just not wanting to listen me not being able to read or write because i have such poor coordination was me being lazy because i was this early speaker so i was thought to be gifted as a toddler and then get in school. I can't, I can't, I still can't read a clock. I have a graduate degree. I can't read a clock. I can't tie my shoes. That's okay. I just use those stretchy laces now and slip them right on and it's fine. But I struggled yeah, so like, much as yeah. <laughs> a child. And now I don't know my body anymore. Uh, it's, that's why modern yeah, trauma like- therapy is, is based on connecting to your body. That's how you heal your trauma. Being gaslit out of our sensory experiences is one of the one of the earliest traumas. Like it's not that loud, or it it doesn't taste too sweet, or it's not too hot, or oh that doesn't hurt. Um. So, no wonder that we, we get to be older and and have no clue that people feel feelings in their bodies because if you can't trust that, yeah. So. Um... Can I just tell you a comment that someone said? Sure. Um, They said, I wish more people understood this. The gaslighters literally convinced many of our biological parents not to hold us or comfort us. Yeah. Yes. Because they will be reinforcing bad behavior. And that's really sad. We would never do that to non-autistic children. I mean, non-autistic children get abused but they make it the standard to abuse autistic children and to convince them that their lives and experiences aren't real. And if you don't know that blindness exists or deafness exists or auditory processing disorder or any of these things, then you're going to gaslight your child. So you need to learn a lot about autism and that means you need to be involved in autistic community. And so, Literally, we publish with Neuroclastic. If you follow our social media, we try so hard as volunteers mostly uh, to make these materials for you and publish them several times a week to break this kind of information down a day at a time. So you can just have your mind blown a little bit in chunks uh, because we're trying to make it accessible because it's so overwhelming to learn all this stuff. But if you follow us, you will gradually just get it. (laughs) It'll just become natural to you to understand autistic kids. Uh, You don't have to have it all right right now. Yeah. 
Um, one more thing is, are you both going to circle back to PDA? Because there was another question about that before. Yeah, I think it's really important that we talk about PDA. Is that okay with you, Tara? Oh, yeah, I'm so PDA. Both of us are very. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to do that now or do you want to wait? Because well, we can talk um, about it. I mean, we've mostly covered the information we're on our last few slides. Um, so we can we don't need the last few slides and we can take questions. Um, it was I noticed that somebody was asking about um, goal setting for PDAs and my experience of that is that if you set a goal, it will it will now become <laughs> a goal is a demand <laughs> but just by virtue of being the goal. What's with all the goal setting? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're, make your own goals for yourself, not for the child um, about hey, I'm going to make a goal that I'm going to learn a whole lot about PDA. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to change your PDA child to be less, quote, stubborn. Uh, my child is PDA. If I say, you know, and she's so excited to go somewhere and I say, let's go get in the car. She's going to be, um, it, she wants to go, but I, I just told her, uh, get in the car, I gave a command, a demand. So it, it paralyzes her. So just, I see immediate extreme anxiety that a lot of people might interpret as just defiance. It's not, I can tell you how it feels on the inside and Kay can too when somebody gives you a demand, even if it's something you wanna do. So we just, someone was asking about in the school setting um, and that, um, her son often refuses to complete tasks related to an IEP goal. The teachers try to simplify the goal, even though they know he can do it. If they simplify it, he gets even more bored and refuses more. <laughs> teachers just need to check a box to move him forward. It's a hard place to be in as a parent. Yeah. If you know they can do it, why are you making them prove it? Yeah. Who's that for? We just put a, a slideshow up please go on Neuroclastic and look at the slideshow about guard railing. Uh, my friend, Sarah Selvaji Hernandez, the autistic OT came up with that term. Um, but while we were discussing, what can we name this? <laughs> a guard railing is a good word for this. Imagine if you went to a nice restaurant with your partner and the waiter comes up and is like, don't get up and wipe your mouth on those drapes over there. They're nice drapes. And when you leave, don't steal the silverware. Immediately, my brain is like, you know, screw you. I want to get up now and wipe my, like put food all over me and rub it all over your entire restaurant and steal everything you have. That's what it would, that's the feeling it would give me. I'm not saying I would definitely do that. I might, who knows? You're not that's, saying you're not either though. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's so <laughs> offensive, but that's how it is to be an autistic person and just constantly get over directed. But that's what we do to disabled people. Uh, you know, we get that fear of them being bullied or whatever. So we overcorrect and over direct, and we want them to prove that they're normal and they can do these things. We know they can don't ask them <laughs> to prove it. If you know, they can do it or don't ask them to do it. Like everyone else does it. When your autistic kid says, I can do this, but I can't do it that way, believe them. Mm -hmm. Let them do it the way they need to do it. It's going to be different because their brain's different. And autistic kids, one thing that people need to realize, non-autistic kids mostly are manipulative. And I don't mean that in any malicious way. I mean, they'll see that you see they're crying and respond to it. And they'll just, they will be conditioned that, you you know, they might get a hug when they want one if they cry. Autistic kids aren't like that. An autistic kid who wants a hug is going to come hug you or ask you for a hug. Um, just generally, that's how we are. We're not as naturally manipulative as most children. And I don't mean manipulative in any kind of negative way. I just mean that kids kids learn to perform all people do you know we ask you how you are and you say oh, i'm fine and you're not <laughs> uh that's a bit manipulative it's not honest 
it's not natural for us to just say I'm fine or not. So we don't ask each other, how are you? Because if they want to tell us, they will. It's just a difference. You need to learn about these differences so you're not over-directing. Um, the comment from Julie there is saying, the goal is set by teachers, not by us as his parents. And yeah, 100%, um, this wasn't uh, directed at, at parents because my experience of working with PDA parents is that they are their children's best advocates and they've been also gaslit a lot and are far more um, likely to be accused of um, not meeting their kids' needs or some form of um, fee, which is like the, the newer version of um, Munchausen's. Like PDA parents get a really rough deal. Um, so I wish I wish schools understood that more because it's it's the PDAs that I see being traumatized by school and then having to have lots of time out of school to recover from the trauma before they can then enter some kind of um, more kind of creative and um, responsive um, education program for them on their own terms. They have to recover from the damage that has been done to them before they can learn again. And they're so hungry for learning, so hungry for, for relational contact. And they're just seen as the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, so do you feel like this always stems from some sort of trauma and like a, a drive for autonomy that is, you know, wasn't supported? I don't necessarily see PDA as a trauma. I see it as a profile. Um, but trauma Same. is trauma is caused to. I, I I don't know any untraumatized PDAs because the systems, yeah, traumatize them. But it's it's just um, it's just a profile. It's just I like, can't give you research for this yet, but I I'm positive 100. percent And I've worked with a lot of people who are currently doing research on this. Mm -hmm. um, so this research will eventually come out. But PDA is a form of OCD, right? It's compulsive. And we recently had an OCD guest who's like a world renowned expert in OCD. And a way she described OCD is if you offered that person a million dollars and they still can't do it, or they still have to do it, it's a compulsion. It's not, right. it's not a choice for them. They can't, they cannot do it. Even if you or stop doing the thing, even if you give them a million dollars. Autistic people are predisposed to that because of neurological differences mm -hmm. uh, to OCD. And I'm positive that PDA is just a form uh, of OCD, except for instead of compulsively doing things, it's more like being frozen to not be able to do the things. It does not feel like sometimes it feels like being defiant. Like I said, if you give somebody that don't steal the silverware in a restaurant. That's going to offend them and they're going to get angry when you over direct. <laughs> so yeah, that some PDA might be that indignant, you know, righteous protest. But also sometimes I badly want to do a thing and I can't even demands I put on myself. You know, I'm hungry. I need to eat, but I can't make myself go do it. It's just... It just needs patience and support and, you know, negotiate, give them more power to make decisions so that they don't feel they can't be over-directed. You just make both of you miserable. You both lose because they can't help yeah. the power struggle. And you're just putting both of you into this <laughs> cycle of, you know, when I tell my kid, get in the car and I see that she can't. I immediately pivot. I know, oh, I gave a command. Let me fix that. I'm like, or we could do this. You choose. And instantly she's like, hmm, I think let's go to the car. <laughs> oh, great. That was that simple. But I could have said, get in the car now and kept going and making her more and more paralyzed and get a meltdown. Or I could just say, we don't have to get in the car. We could also, and give her a choice. I know she wants to get in the car. She wants to go to the place. 
Um, but I've given her that choice. So now she doesn't feel like I'm making her. And not every teacher is going to be sympathetic to that. And it's going to be really hard. And I don't mean to say that this is all easy. Um, because none of it's easy. Uh, but we make adjustments as we learn and that makes things easier. And the more adjusting, we have great harmony in my household. I don't, I do think that my child would be totally different had I not had the information that I have. I think that she went from a level three to a level one diagnosis, which is like the highest support needs to the lower. And I don't think that anything, um, I think she would have continued to be level three if I didn't have the information that I have. Not that that would have meant her brain is different, but that her outside behavior and her dysregulation, her distress would have been so extreme that she would have appeared, quote, severe <laughs> to people who think that's what autism is. And that's, it would have just been her being distressed all the time because her needs weren't being met but now her needs are being met and she's the happiest child I've ever seen in my life. So I'm good with that. It's okay that things are different, but yeah, that's, that happens. Thank you. So I guess that's a good segue then into your next portion. Sure, go ahead. And move back. <laughs> there's a couple. Th there's a couple good things left in this that that you would love uh, to. You can move that, that. We've talked about all this. Where do you Keep want me going. To <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when to stop. Oh wait, go back. So, um, water safety. Uh, drowning is one of the main causes of death for autistic children and adults. Um, so water safety, uh, Jules Edwards, uh, who's autistic typing, that, that was her recommendation that we put in there. Um, and it's a good one. It's very critically important. So we, we do recommend uh, swimming and water safety as a, as a survival skill. And you can move that. And, uh, and again, <laughs> yeah. and again, Oh, I missed the the slides that had the um, like the OT and the wheelbarrow. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you find that one in the the ones in that region of the slide too. OT and the wheelbarrow. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there might be one before this, but I'm not sure. But oh yeah, so when's therapy necessary? Are they choking? even on saliva, they need speech and language therapy or an ENT or a GI doctor if it's caused by GERD, um, but gastric reflux. A lot of autistic kids have that. So it might be a medical issue. It, it's always a medical issue. Uh, dysphagia, different swallowing conditions. That needs a therapy so your child doesn't choke. If they're in extreme sensory distress and you can't accommodate them by just you know, the standard fidget toys and weighted blankets and better lighting. Uh, you need an occupational therapist who's specialized in sensory. And you should follow the autistic OT and uh, Rachel Dorsey, SLP. Um, somebody please put those links. I know we got autistic people who know these people in the, in the chat. Please put links to those profiles yes. up so that people oh, can find them. If you're, in the, them. if you're in the UK, Emily Lees is um Emily Lee's is a it's a great autistic SLT in the UK. I'm gonna put the links in. Thank you. So if your child's not using utensils at age three, that's fine. There's a whole lot of cultures in this world that don't use utensils ever. This is a really sophisticated uh, skill. My child can't stand to have any food touch her skin and she's clumsy because motor coordination is is her biggest deficit. Um, so just eat with your child. Some, some autistic kids need to move and eat at the same time. And so if you wanna have that sit down at dinner, some, some autistic kids, the, and this is me, eating is miserable. I do not get any pleasure at all from it, but it's a necessity. But I need to be, 
if you smack your mouth and chew and I can hear it and I can hear everything, it's going to distress me. I cry at dinner tables as an adult sometimes because it's literal torture. I would rather you punch me in the face than to smack and chew. I can't help it. I hate that I'm like that. I try to Jedi my brain to not be so upset by it, but I can't help it. So let me watch television while I eat, or I'm maybe going to starve to death. Uh, don't talk to me while I'm eating because my brain can't do two things at the same time. So you, you might need to not worry about some of these things. Just let your kid do them differently because a lot of things can be miserable. If your child can't drink without a straw, you're in, you're therapists are going to try and make your kids drink with a regular cup. I'm 41 and I can't drink without a straw. I'll choke and spill it every time. I still use a straw. <laughs> Let your kids use a sippy cup forever. You know, they make them for adults now that are non-spill. It's normal now. That's good what society has normalized. Uh, motor, <laughs> uh, motor planning deficits by making these products everywhere. So it's fine if your kids are using non-spill things with the straw built in and the sensory of sucking on a straw that gives resistance can help your children develop the skills that they need to be better at swallowing to. So use the straw. It's fine. <laughs> it's, it's okay. You don't need that as a therapy. It, your kid might be distressed by spilling liquid on themselves. Uh, communication. If they're not speaking before age three, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to listen to me, but I would personally recommend not to worry. Um, do, do what you can to support them to have ways to communicate their needs, but it's very normal for autistic kids to not speak at the same time because they like to learn everything before they try it. And I'm the same way. I can't do something until I take in all the information first. And then once I feel like I'm going to be able to do it the first time, I'll try it. But I don't try until I know everything first. And that's how my child was. And she didn't, I knew she could understand, but she just didn't speak. And I didn't worry when they told me if I don't get her in these therapies, she's never going to have communication. I just knew it was okay. And it did turn out okay. She's still has a lot of speech differences. Her speech is not reliable when she's dysregulated. So if I can see that she's not making any sense, I start trying to troubleshoot what sensory thing is dysregulated. And it might be that she's just happy. She's really excited and she won't make any sense when she speaks, but she's still communicating how excited she is. And I just do my best and it's fine. Just do your best. Um, but by age three, if your speech therapist tries to force your kids to speak and doesn't try to give them some kind of access, alternative communication, and your child is clearly protesting and communicating a protest, uh, and you're ignoring it, you're ignoring their only communication. They are communicating and you're teaching them it's not okay. And your child may never be able to communicate uh, fully with spoken language, no matter how well they understand and could communicate with the right um, alternative communication. Uh, so if your speech therapist is trying to force them to use mouth words and won't, you know, you know your kid's hungry because they're going to the cabinet and pulling food out or the fridge and you, you're like, nope, you have to use your words first. That's cruelty. They're communicating in the way that they have and you're telling them that's not enough. Um, so you gotta, you gotta kick that, you gotta fire that speech therapist and find a better one. And the OT, uh, if they're trying to force your child to um, just tolerate sensory hell, without complaint. You know, my child can't stand a toilet flushing and she covers her ears every time she started having accidents again. And I realized that it's because she's so afraid 
of the sound of the toilet because it hurts her. She has extreme hyperacusis. She hears everything. And so now I tell her to put the lid down and leave the room and I'll flush it for her. And that wouldn't work in a school setting. And I know that not every parent has that privilege, but to force an autistic child with hyperacusis to just not complain when they are in pain is going to end up with an adult like me who does not understand or know anything about their body and how to exist in it and communicate their needs or even recognize and understand them. So, and as an adult, I can't get access to any therapies that would help me. I don't qualify. They don't, insurance doesn't cover them. So don't turn your kids into me. I'm telling you, this is the worst thing I would never want for my child. So I accommodate the hell out of everything that I can because I don't want this for her. I know how it, I cannot believe I'm alive and a lot of my friends are not, you know, and that uh, anymore. Our average lifespan is 38 and a half. And top two causes of death for autistics without intellectual disability are suicide and heart disease without congenital uh, heart problems. So from stress, they literally die of distress. I've outlived my life expectancy and barely, I barely made it to this point. I don't want that for my child. So I accommodate everything because I know the future she'll have if I don't. And so it's really hard to homeschool and I'm so busy and I'm so, uh, I'm also overwhelmed because I'm autistic too, but I'm less overwhelmed because I don't stress as much because I have a great community to support me, to tell me, hey, this was, this was a thing. Here's what I did to work around that. And so engage in autistic community, neuroclassic, some, some spaces in autistic community are brutal <laughs> um, because they're full of traumatized autistics that are going to be angry at you for doing the things that their parents did because you have tools. And so when autistic people get angry at you, understand that they don't know you and they're traumatized and forgive that, please. But um, neuroclastic has a great culture that's really supportive. Uh, you're not going to be a disability rights, uh, you know, pro when you enter our community. You're not going to have all the right language. You're going to say words that are offensive because you've learned from the mainstream. And we have a very different language in our community. We probably say words we don't realize you don't know what they mean because they've just become common to us. But we really do work so hard to support you we do this for free like 18 hours a day a lot of us are just spinning trying to because it's that important to us so um join our you know engage in our social media and even people who aren't neuroclastic in the in the audience are amazing we have the best audience ever um on our social media so we, we try to make it like I said, we're not always a safe space. You will sometimes get people who will maybe be a bit too blunt or aggressive or judgmental to you or, but know that, that we care and we want to help and we're trying really hard to make it because we know that your children need us so that they don't suffer as much as we did. Um, and we, we love them. Our community is their family and it's life-saving. So please join us in community and we will help you. You're gonna have a million questions come up all the time. I do. And I learn, um, we had Oswin Latimer on here uh, last week. And I learned so much from Oswin. Just, I just read for years, just followed them and read what they told people. And I was like, wow, what an amazing source of information. Um, and so, you know, some community elders have really helped me a lot uh, to be 
because I didn't have the instincts for everything. I do have instincts that a lot of uh, non-autistic people would have about why my daughter does things that don't make sense to a lot of people. I get it. But there are other things that I didn't have instincts for and other people had troubleshooted and troubleshot, shooted. Well, how do you say it? <laughs> Other people have figured out ways <laughs> to support and work around and work with uh, things, creative things. Um, some kids get in a motor loop and they unzip and unbutton their pants and they cannot make themselves stop. That it's it's literally impossible. And someone said um, their non-speaking child spelled, put a rubber band between my zipper and the button on my pants so I can pull on that. And that will give me that sensory uh, that, that my body is trying to do this thing over and over. I can't make it stop like a tick. And that was all that, that, and so like a lot of parents have had that issue and that's been just an amazing help. And if they really need to, they can take that rubber band off. Um, but it's just helped them to, you know, not expose themselves in public on accident. And just little things like that, that you don't want to override a child's bodily autonomy. And that's why you need community because you never know, am I, especially if they still, don't have reliable communication. Am I doing the right thing or not? That's why you need community to help you. And you won't find the same. You'll get totally different advice from autistic people than you would from the mainstream. And it's going to, it's going to be wonderful. Your, your life will be a lot easier. Jen, do, would you say that's accurate for you? A thousand percent. Like, to anyone watching who is like just wading into all of this, the information that I got from the mainstream, from the media, from, you know, autism organizations was literally opposite of what I learned from the autistic community. And it wasn't until I started reading autistic experiences, like the first book I read was Edo and Autism Land, the non-speaker who types. And like, I was like, oh my gosh, that's my kid. And, you know, he talked about the frustration of having, um, a body, you know, that didn't cooperate with him and how it felt to be assumed that, you know, he couldn't understand or couldn't do things. And then, you know, I remember reading, I think like I think I read from Judy Endow and it was like autistic kids are not like autistic adults. And essentially she was saying like, calm down because we grow up too. And like part, part of the issue is that when, when we parents get a diagnosis for our kids from these mainstream like organizations, they don't give us autistic resources. So everything that we're getting is from this lens of a deficit model based on, you know, assumptions that neurotypical people have made over the years, um, aside from like the research standards, which in autism are completely lower than they are in almost any other field. It's based on secondhand information that is not um, from, you know, the actual people living in those bodies. And for me, it was absolutely liberating to find autistic people and be like, oh my God, first of all, even you know, my, my child is a non-speaker. She has multiple forms of AAC. We're still, you know, working toward that, but like, even if someone isn't exactly my, like my kid, you are part of the same community and share experiences of being marginalized and misunderstood. And, you know, even if one thing isn't exactly the same, you might have very similar experiences in other areas. And you just cannot get that from neurotypical organizations that are literally part of this autism industrial complex who 
where the systems are incentivized to dehumanize essentially and um, make money off of our posing autistic people as an epidemic that needs to be mitigated. And so for parents listening, like literally it's life-changing to start learning from the autistic community and you, you cannot get it anywhere else, but there. I'll give it back to you. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so. And the other thing, um, maybe the other thing to add too, is that, um, like, especially if this is like somewhat new to you, like I know, I didn't know anything about autism. Um, I didn't know any other autistic people as far as I knew. And so I had a lot of internalized ableism and everyone around me had internalized ableism. And so every question that I got and every recommendation I got was kind of coming from an ableist perspective, even if it wasn't intentional, even if it was meant with, you know, wanting to help, there was still this frame of reference that was like, well, you better hurry up, you know, this whole um, urgency and the, you know, getting on meeting these milestones and catching up and things. So it is scary. Like it, it's terrifying when you're hearing things from that kind of perspective. And so that's why like you need to be able to pause because all this pressure that's coming at us is part of this narrative that feeds into this whole industrial complex of commodifying our kids um, and also of othering our kids. So like none of this is happening in a vacuum. It's all happening within an ableist society. And also the fact that capitalism has caused autism to become something that is a profit making machine. So you have to understand that first before you decide whether or what you're going to do. Um, and the main thing is that being able to support your kid means that you have to learn from the community that they belong to. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, because that was... Thank you. <laughs> that was what we needed to hear. Um, and people don't, you know, there's also this like purposeful counter movement to like convince you that autistic adults are, it, you see it from some of the bigger um, social media yeah. influencers uh, who have institutional backing, who get paid as influencers to say, I'm autistic. Don't listen to them. They're just a bunch of loud bullies who tell you that it, everything you do is wrong. But all their, if, look, if you're going to something and they're talking to you about your emotions and validating your emotions, that's, you need that. You do need that. But sometimes they're validating you to continue doing the wrong things um, because they have an agenda. So you need to think, does this person, is this person trying to, to prevent me from listening to something that's going to, that I need to know? Is this person, does this person teach me about how my child actually works? Or are they just talking about emotions and how hard it is? And I'm not saying that you should never vent or, you know, have safe spaces to explore your feelings, even your difficult feelings. Um, but um, if they're not teaching you how to do better and they're just telling you you're doing fine, you're doing your best. Yeah, you're doing your best, but you'd probably like to do it better. You'd probably like the information that would help you and your child to suffer less. And 
go get that. And yeah, sometimes people might be rude to you in comments. This is going to happen. I'm just going to be honest with you. You might have some people just say some really rude things to you and invalidate you. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of trauma, but most do your best to not take things personally, but also to see that if someone is that passionate, that they're begging you not to do something. Um, is there, is there a reason their emotions are that big? What have they suffered that makes them say, don't do this? Uh, because why would they be doing, I just think people don't do things that have no point. We do things that we do things because they're, they have a point. And so that, you know, not every autistic person is an expert uh, and autism. They only know what their own experience is like. And so if you have someone who doesn't have significant motor planning deficits or motor disinhibition, which is uh, what most people consider severe autism is going to be severe motor planning and motor disinhibition issues. So they can't do purposeful movement, even sometimes for speech, but they also do movements, actions that they don't want to do. So they're starving and they throw their food on the floor or they see somebody's plate and they grab it. It's an impulse, like an intrusive thought, but their body follows it. So um, like OCD, one form of OCD is like disruption. Uh, you know, you're sitting at, a, I have this, you're sitting at a table and you have these intrusive thoughts, like flip this table. And it's just a passing thought. Your brain and your mind are different. Your brain's an organ, like a stomach that, that belches and passes gas and has belly aches and growls. But that's not you. That's not your personality. Hiccups are not your personality. Sneezes are not your personality. Asthma attacks are not your personality. Those things are just organs that you don't plan. And that's how motor disinhibition works and intrusive thoughts. But that uh, things that get considered severe, that's motor stuff. Not every autistic person is going to understand that. So if they haven't studied and learned about that, they won't know if you are, um, if you're hanging out at neuroclastic, uh, in our comment sections, we do have a lot of people who understand motor disinhibition, communication disorders. Um, we've prioritized that it's taken us years to get there. We work with some of the greatest, I see some of the greatest people, please drop your links, Elizabeth, and somebody put links for reach every voice, uh, in the chat for us. Um, if you have non-speaking children, you're going to want to follow the links that are about to show up. Uh, isn't it great that I can rely on my community so much that I can just say this and I know that somebody is out there going to put these links in the chat for us. But um, there are a lot of autistic people who don't know everything about every autistic uh, profile, especially for non-speaking and people with severe motor planning deficits. Um, but that does not mean that their cognition, their ability to understand things is different. They don't have the ability to demonstrate them. They need very specialized, um, informed <laughs> by neuroscience, uh, supports. And there are places that can provide that. And hopefully there's some links popping up in your chat to help you with that. We have any more questions? I didn't learn a lot of things about myself until I started reading things from non-speaking autistics. Like there was so much that I didn't understand. Why would I make bird sounds in conferences and faculty <laughs> meetings or slam my hands down on the table? It was so embarrassing, but I just, or why would I just get stuck walking down steps and just get stuck and I can't make myself finish walking down the steps at my place of work. And people were like, what's wrong? Do you need help? Should we? I've had so many times people tell me, should I call an ambulance? <laughs> because I can't explain why I just did a thing, but it's just motor disinhibition. I have tick disorder, but non-typical. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like I do the same tick every single time. Sometimes I do. 
but uh, I didn't know any of this stuff. My brother had severe Tourette's and I didn't look like him. So I didn't, I just, just didn't understand what was going on with me. I thought I was crazy. And now I get it. Now I can forgive myself and I can just laugh at it and be like, sorry, I can't always, I have tics and people get it and they're fine with it. And they laugh with me and I'm not embarrassed anymore. Um, I get it when my child does something, my child, sometimes, especially when she's little, she's better at it now. She'll get so excited. She'll just punch me. She was a happy, she just gets so overjoyed and just punch me in the face. And she was a toddler. So it was fine. It didn't, you know, it wasn't like blacking my eye, but I knew. And then she would immediately like gasp, like, Oh my God, what did I just do? And she would cry. And I was try to make it silly and it was okay because I understand because I've done that before with my first boyfriend I was just so dysregulated by joy when I was in high school like several times I just hit him I was like what did I just I'm so sorry and it I didn't hurt him and he thought it was funny but like um I just feel so overwhelmed with my emotions I haven't yeah. You just did a thing, but it was just understanding finally after all these years why I'm the way I am uh, is life saving. I wish I had this information earlier. I could have uh, avoided a dangerous marriage that uh, I barely survived. It was like a hostage situation because I could. I didn't know I was autistic. I didn't know how to look for danger in people or that. Other people weren't honest as I was. Other people might be manipulating because uh, you know, I was more financially stable. So they had a place to live and they would just, you know, they saw me as an easy target, but I didn't realize how easy of a target I was. And I didn't know that I was being abused, even though in hindsight, it's horrifying and extreme. I didn't know because I had suffered so much with people some things aren't abusive to non-autistic people because they, they don't suffer from everyday things like I did, but they were to me um, because I was being pushed beyond distress almost every day and having to pretend I was fine because I just, my brain is very different and I couldn't do everything on everybody else's schedule you don't, yeah. you don't want to do that to your child. So learning is, it's amazing for your relationships. And when you start focusing on how can I form secure attachments with my child, you might start singing all of your words to your toddler. That's how I got my child to start speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I re I heard that some autistic kids are right brain language learners and they're sing songy. And if you start singing and make a routine out of it, then it will help them. And it did. Oh, that's, that's what got my child to start uh, making more sense of language. And she is that super sing songy uh, prosody that, that yeah. some autistic kids have. That's my child. But yeah. I learned all these things from the autistic community and I'm so, I feel so privileged to have come into this information just in time. Yeah, absolutely. And having this knowledge, like you said, it really is life-changing. And one of the questions that we had was about, um, from Femme Intangible, um, how do I understand my child who seems to be emotionally a lot like your daughter, but if I test her, I think she'll go under the radar and not get diagnosed with autism. Maybe she really isn't, but then, um, what is it? And she says, um, she's definitely neuro spicy, not sure what kind. <laughs> I love, I love that. that. I love it. <laughs> um, and, um, then I want to understand her and help her feel understood, not sure where to turn everywhere on the web advises the pause. And I think what she might need, but I can't figure out to save my life. Um, and she said, I'm just like her. And even that doesn't help. So I wonder if you have any advice for her. So first of all, 
welcome to the community. You're probably one of us and so is your child. <laughs> um, <laughs> so welcome to being neuro spicy. We call it a neuro lurker when you're exploring it. Hey, am I autistic or not? This all feels really <laughs> relatable, but I don't want to appropriate because I'm not sure yet. Take your time, explore it, diagnose as, uh, you know, you don't become autistic the day you get diagnosed. <laughs> you become autistic. You're autistic when you're born, right? They, they've recently diagnosed a fetus successfully as autistic. So we know <laughs> it's genetic. You probably are too. And that's okay. Engage in community. We can help you with specific things. Like when you have this one specific thing that you're working on. Um, because our general advice is going to be applicable to some kids and not others, or it might not be specifically what your child is dealing with. So you can, um, we have also a private group uh, called Neuroclastic has an article for that on Facebook that you can join that. Um, here, our moderators hardly have to do yeah, our moderators hardly have to do anything because the community just comes through and answers the questions and they're so helpful. So that that might be a good place that you don't have to put. And you can also ask questions anonymously in that group um, so that you're not um, violating your child's privacy too. So that might be a helpful way to, to bring your... Um, specific questions. Do we have okay. any more? Let me just read through to make sure. Um, also, that was just a really empathetic question. It's, you can tell that you really care about your child and you're doing yeah, doing the right thing. You're trying. You're trying to learn, and that's wonderful. Just keep, keep doing what you're doing. Keep asking the questions and engage in community because they'll help with all that stuff. Yeah. Um, most of what's left, I think, are just comments um, showing appreciation and um, agreement with your message and. Um, I think too, one thing is um, like a lot of the message here is really like trust your kid and trust yourself, right? And like, despite the messages of fear that parents get, like, you know what things soothe your kid, or at least you might know some things that soothe your kid. And it might be very different from what you might find soothing. But the key is like, don't let other people take that from you. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and like other people will tell us, well, you're going to reinforce this or you're coddling them or any number of things. But like the goal here is that we want healthy autistic kids. We don't want traumatized autistic kids who are trying to hide who they are or act in a way that's unhealthy and abnormal for them. So trust, trust in the thing that you know is working. And when you really feel like you don't know what's working, lean into autistic community. Yeah. Yeah, not, not the, um, not the kind of parenting material that's out there written by neurotypicals who are going to tell you things that are just making it worse. Um, and selling a product. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, um, if somebody is trying to therapize a two-year-old for 40 hours or 30 hours or 10 hours a week, that's abuse. That's, uh, there's no reason to do behavior change for 10 hours a week for a two-year-old. Your two-year-old mm -hmm. is developing, their, their systems are not mature. Your job is to support their development as it unfolds. Like I said, you wouldn't put a two-year-old in radical reading intervention therapy just because my kid could read it too. 
So should I have put my child in a in an intensive toileting therapy at two? No, <laughs> I knew what that was like. I knew uh, that, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't go spend the night. My grandparents were autistic. My parents weren't. Oh, I love I loved my parents so much. I love my, I love being around my grandparents because they got me at the soul level. (laughs) They, I never once, I spent every day, all day, just trying to get to their, there were just a couple houses down. But if I used the bathroom on myself, I wasn't allowed to go to their house. And that was the worst thing in the world because that was my one place where I was understood and had no pressure. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I didn't, to my parents thought that I had the worst attitude and I was misbehaving and stubborn. I never once told my grandparents no to anything. I never got in an argument with them. I'm talking about like my grandmother just passed a couple years ago. Not once. (laughs) That's why I have a child. She said, I need a granddaughter. Okay. Memo. We said what memo where I was from memo and papa, (laughs) but okay. Memo. (laughs) sis she said I, I need a great granddaughter so I gave her one but she told me to I never told her no but I it, I'm so glad I want I it was good timing uh but I'm just saying like I, never once did I have a single conflict with them in my entire life and they were huge in my life because they just let me be who I was they loved how I was because I was like them They got me. And that's the thing, like you can learn to love the differences in your child, uh, but you have to also learn to not need everyone else's approval because a lot of people are going to, you know, and you go, I I was recently at the vet, my cat (laughs) had to, had some clumps, had to be shaved (laughs) and uh, (laughs) he got some clumps, but I had to sit in the waiting room for a while and there was an autistic little girl. I knew she was autistic. Nobody said that, but she was just spinning and joyful. And she had these wild curls and she was wearing clothes that looked like a costume. I could tell she picked them out herself (laughs) and she was just really adorable. And I just love this child. I thought, what an amazing little girl. And as soon as they left the older people, I was so shocked by this. They were like, I can't believe. And one person was like, I work in a grocery store. And when they come in, I'm like, why don't they do something to discipline that child? Just make a noise all the time. And they were complaining about this, you know, uh, wonderful little four-year-old child with these wild curls, just happy and whimsical. And her mom was letting her as she should have. The kid didn't do anything wrong. It made my day. I was so stressed sitting there just because I don't like humans or the public. (laughs) It's really hard for me to be in a place like that um, in a small room with a lot of people. But uh, that, that child was wonderful. And I couldn't believe that everyone in there was like kids these days and parents just don't blah, blah. And they looked at me and they were like, what what, can you believe? And I was like, I thought that little child was excellent. And everybody looked so uncomfortable and nobody spoke. Everybody had been talking to each other and there was just this rapport going on and everybody stopped talking. And I was like, well, you know, (laughs) we got to fix the next generation. We got to heal this generational trauma because that, that attitude of everyone needs to behave and be the same. And what it means to behave is like to sit there and, and be quiet and not be seen. And, and it's not even the way that neurotypical kids are expected to behave. It's like this made up, you know, persona of childhood and it's completely inappropriate. (laughs) Yeah. Like autistic people are held at a much higher standard than neurotypical people. Um, and that's a problem, not only because you shouldn't have those expectations of anyone, but especially for people who are in a minority group with these, you know, imposed expectations by the majority, it's even more messed up when you think of it that way. 
Can I ask you all one more question? Of course. Okay, so um, please one question. Is it still okay to learn DIR floor time, OT and Hannon style speech therapy? Can there be anything wrong? I'm not gonna withhold anything to get her to say things. I'm gonna put, um, I gotta go on neuroclastic and find it, but we have a, it's not specific to any kind of therapy. So it doesn't say, you know, is your OT or your DIR or whatever a therapist um, abusive or whatever, but it's just, are they doing these things that could be harmful to an autistic child? It's like a checklist for you to, here it is, how to spot a good or bad therapist. And it just gives you like, if they're doing these things, that's harmful. Don't do it. And there we go. And these things are great. So that link is now in the chat. And hopefully that will, you know, that's great. answer some questions for you. Yeah. And just yeah, search, because- surf around NeuroClassic. We have over a thousand articles and resources on there. So there's very few topics we haven't covered in depth. And please, at the top of the page, we have um, most of what you hear from autistic people uh, and most of the community dialogue has come from white autistic advocates uh, from the United States, Canada, UK. And that experience is very different. Um, Autism looks different in different cultures. If you have a collectivist culture, uh, being autistic is not as bad as it is in in a culture like the United States. It's highly individualistic um, because they love when you're specialized (laughs) in a collectivist culture. So when you're you don't have to be good at every single thing and totally independent because independence is not a value in, in a lot of cultures. In my cultures, uh, everything is community based. And the way that I grew up, I grew up in the most impoverished place in the country, in the United States. But I really miss so much. Uh, I don't live there anymore. It was in the backwoods of West Virginia. Um, But if your car broke down somewhere, 20 people are going to pull over and fix your car. If somebody is harassing you, somebody else is going to run them off with extreme threats of violence. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But at the same time, you know, we kept each other account. I never knew anybody call the cops for a single reason ever in my entire life (laughs) growing up. Um, So it was a very different. And we did not always have enough money for food, but everybody uh, grew their own. And in the mountains, there's not a lot of sunshine, so you can't have a big crop. But you can have a small garden that that is placed in exactly that spot in your yard that gets some sun for a few hours a day. And we would grow things and can them and trade. And uh, so we fed each other and we would make a big giant meal and take it around to the older people. We respected the elders. And when your children were different, everybody kind of took care of them. And I'm not saying that was a great place to grow up and it, it and people were really hard on children, and that was not great. But there were great things. So we need community. We don't have it in the United States, and things are very different from just the the mainstream that is mostly built on white supremacy. So um, you need to look for diversity. You need to read. Yeah. The experience that we have, um, we have at the top of our website uh, tabs for black uh, to read black autistic experiences, to read uh, non speaking autistic experiences. Please do that. Even if your child speaks, you're going to learn so much about autism that you never heard because it's only being talked about for people who understand that motor planning and motor disinhibition uh, 
affects 87% of autistic people. But if we can speak, we don't even know that. We don't even know what that means yeah. or think about it. So get you some diversity in your reading um, and focus on community. You find your local attachment parenting groups and ask, is there anybody in here who follows the autistic community and has autistic kids? That's amazing. I've got some wonderful local people who that's how I found out I was autistic um, from, from a local autistic person who follows the autistic community. And I'm so grateful. I will be indebted to her forever, <laughs> but um, build a community that is the community you need to see. And some, some, a lot of people, uh, there are groups on Facebook. There's, oh, I wish I could remember something with the word eclectic in it, uh, but it's for people who do um, homeschool or oh, yeah. uh, some um, SEA is the initials for that group. But um, you can find, people who who get it who are learning who understand the value of collective community and um understand disability from disabled people's perspective who will you know you teach one day they teach one day you take turns watching each other's kids respite care is amazing you, you know, a lot of autistic kids do better with online learning because there's less demand avoidance from a computer <laughs> you can control the volume of a computer's voice and pause it and so some my daughter uh she tires out very quickly with person instruction but when it's on a device and it has like robots and frogs and fun whimsical characters she loves it and she'll so you know you just got to try the things and not everybody has the privilege to do that, but um, build your community. Yeah. I posted the um, secular eclectic. That's it. <laughs> um, secular eclectic academic group. And then there's also um, unschooling every family embracing neurodivergent and disabled learners. Um, yes. That's also a really good group. And um, I feel like more people are realizing that they can homeschool or unschool their autistic kids and um, like that it doesn't have to look like school and that you can really cater it to like the particular child if you do that. Of course, that comes with, you know, the ability to be able to do that and the privilege that that um, takes. But I know like there's other groups like um, Untigering is another page and they were recently having uh, a webinar on how like even people with less privi privilege, like there are workarounds um, that people can find in order to do this if their child is really struggling in the school system and they feel like, you know, they want to explore this as an option. As, wanna, as wanna... a parent with no income, and my husband is a welder, so we uh, live far <laughs> below the poverty line. And um, we live very simply. Uh, my child has respite care. And that has been amazing. You uh, can check in with your local, oh, what is that called? Jen, you probably know. You probably remember what the, the local authority that you would contact to, um, to help you get set up and apply for respite care is, is you can choose. You hire your own um, in care Georgia. worker and it can give you Perform. like what's it called perform care does that sound no i don't know but um you know go in your local groups <laughs> your local online social communities and ask you know look for disabled or they usually say special needs kids and i don't like that but you know it's fine just go in those groups and ask what do i need to do to get respite care and a million like 
parents of disabled kids can be so helpful. And uh, respite care is so helpful for us because um, a person comes here and works with my child. And I got to, I, I hired an autistic person who understands autism. And I know that my child is, is um, it, it lets me work on neuroclastic and um, I don't pay for it. That is state funded um, because my child's disabled. And she also has elder Stanlos connective tissue disorder. And so do I, um, but that helps me a whole lot because doing everything by myself would be a lot from both of us. And then, you know, right now they're, they're out playing at a park and they do, you know, I make little activities like here's a bird watching book and uh, here's an outdoor scavenger hunt. And you can go do this today and teach about this. And, um, do your, do some online things for things that aren't your specialty and you can you can be extremely poor i'm telling you from experience and and change your lifestyle you can't you can't maybe can't live the same way but you can make it work with a community that will support you and help you find all those resources cuz it's too hard to do by yourself and help you know how to skip wait lists and what to say to not get denied. And a lot of times people use these intervention therapies like daycare and babysitting because they don't know about respite care for disabled children with high support needs. Um, so that's just really, they, they want a babysitter. <laughs> they want a nanny and they can take their kids and drop them off at an ABA clinic and, you know, go to work or do something. Um, but this is an alternative that still gives you that freedom, but then you get to control who is with your kid and what they're doing with yeah. them. And that's very helpful. Yeah. And honestly, that in and of itself gives you so much more power than putting them in the, like a public school system where, you know, it's like you get who you get and, you know, it might not be what you want and might not be good for the child. Um, of course, you know, people then people, I mean, having to deal with the public school system is exhausting for most people. Um, and, um, it takes quite a bit, you know, to, to advocate for services, you know, IDEA is still not fully funded and, um, I'm not sure about how it is in the UK, but I'm sure it's probably similar in terms of, you know, this is again, another system that was built without autistic people, without any input from autistic people or anyone else with any other disability. Um, and so, you know, even if people are trying to do their best, there's these structural and attitudinal and all sorts of other, you know, barriers, um, that create problems. And again, it's, uh, like, you know, the person mentioned before, it's kind of this, they have these certain goals that they need to meet on the paper, you know, and regardless of whether that's really what is in the best interest of that kid, they need to get that goal met. So I think another area that parents can really try to focus on is rethinking the goals that are being written for your child, because you're part of that IEP team. So even if you're, even if, you know, homeschooling or unschooling isn't something that you can do basically try to try to in, give as much input as possible for what's going to be healthy uh, for your kid you know with it within these systems that were not designed with them in mind um, so maybe like um, my last question to you both is just like what do you want to leave parents with today? Obviously everyone listening, you should go to neuroclastic, <laughs> read up and, and, you know, learn from all, of, all of these experiences, but, um, what would both of you want to leave people with today? Okay. You want to take that first? <laughs> I've been talking a lot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's okay. good. It's important. You know, people need and want to hear this and, you know, 
we don't really get this from many other places, so. Yeah, so you, so your kid is autistic or you think they're autistic. Um, you're probably right because generally neuro parents or neurotypical people and parents of neurotypical people don't spend hours and days wondering if their kids are autistic. So let's just assume they are. Um, they're already perfect. They're already just who they're, meant, who they're meant to be and their brains are pretty much developing as they should be. Get support if there's anything standing in the way of them living their best life. So if they can't like if they can't breathe and swallow, that's an issue. If they can't have they can't have food to keep to nourish them, that needs dealing with. And if they're in incredible distress, they need an OT. But otherwise, just let love them as they are and don't let anyone talk you out of that. And um, autistic community, find it. Sure, it's neuroplastic, but it's also everywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to kind of second that. Um, and also, when you engage in community, you might have a one. So my child had an OT, and she was the best person. I mean, she I'm still friends with her. We, we, she was only with us, um, you know, an hour every two weeks for a few months. But we became extremely close. And most of the time, I was lecturing her on what not to do. And I knew it was pedantic, but I didn't care. So it was my only child and I wasn't going to let, it. you know, my child would, she would play with my child. My child would finally warm up and then she would grab and hug my child to help her get used to being touched. And then my child would start pulling at her clothes and I could tell she didn't want to be touched. And I was like, stop that. What are you doing? Can't you see that's distressing her? And she was like, well, I'm trying to help her sensitize to this. Don't. But now that OT follows neuroclassic and she learns some things. She has autistic children. She's wonderful. And she just didn't know. She was just doing what she learned. Yeah. Um, so you can work if you have a wonderful support person who just needs to not do you can correct them you can tell them not to do certain things I would never recommend putting your child in a therapy if they can't fluently communicate to you and if they don't communicate if they can communicate but just don't tell you I would never put that child uh, in a therapy that I couldn't observe so if they tell you you can't watch what they're doing and mm -mm. <laughs> look at every Fine. single goal look at every goal that they have take those goals go to the autistic community get a neuro classic or another group that you feel or page that you feel is supportive go to people like the autistic ot and and rachel dorsey slp go to uh foundations for divergent minds and all these and you don't have to remember this just remember neuroclassic and come ask us in the comments. Hey, I've got this thing. It doesn't even have to be relevant to the post. Just ask, hey, I've got this thing. Can somebody give me advice? And people will. Or, hey, this is a goal somebody gave my child. What do you think about this? And this is what my child is doing. Can you help me understand this? You don't have to know everything by the end of this webinar. Like, just yeah. know that you have community that you can you now have another resource, a big, vast one with an amazing community with just this beautiful collective knowledge that one person might not know what to do, but the next one does, or one thing might not work, but the next thing does. Um, so you can go and find your community and be in community and the healthy community that is trying to help you and your child have a healthy, emotionally supportive relationship where you're both happy and you both know that you're looking out for each other and that you want the best for each other. My child takes care of me. Today she was like, mama, I'm your eye doctor. And she brought me my glasses. And I realized I forgot that I wasn't wearing them. I can't see. 
and I was stressed, but I didn't realize it because I can't understand my body's signals. And then she brought them to me. And also talk, this is the biggest thing. Speak out loud in front of your child all the time, phrases that are about how brains work. Talk to them. My daughter now says, hold on, brain's loading. And that has been so amazing for us because I would just keep repeating things. And I didn't know why she wasn't responding. Now she says, hold on, brain's loading. I say that. I'm like, wait, just because she'll just keep asking. I'm like, wait, I'm thinking about it. My brain's loading. So now she says it when she needs, when her brain is loading and she's still processing and she's not ready yet. She needs a minute. And say things like that. My brain's loading or I need a minute. Start start regulating your own emotions out loud in a healthy way in front of your child so that they learn, okay, I, I can start to pay attention when this is happening to me and I can say this out loud and get help or be understood that I need a minute. Or I will say, you know, I'm starting to get overwhelmed. I just need to go be in a quiet room for a few minutes. And so now she'll say things similar to that. Um, or I just need some downtime, I'll say all the time. And now she's starting to say those things. And that's been so helpful because she's starting to realize when she's getting overstimulated and, yeah. and verbalize it. And that's made a huge difference because I never wanted to, to make my child overstimulated and dysregulated and distressed. But I couldn't always tell what it was that she needed more or less of. And, and just communicating out loud, narrating what I do to accommodate myself. Saying things like when something hurts, I say it out loud. Oh, my head is hurting right now. I'm going to rest for a little while. Did I forget to eat? Did I forget to drink something? Is that why my head hurts? Things like that all the time. Or I haven't gone to the restroom for a while. Do I need to pee? And stuff like that. And it's just, or I can't stand to touch this. It, it bothers me. Or this fabric is, is, is itching me or whatever. I say these things out loud to my child and it's given her permission to communicate. Uh, nobody ever said stuff like my clothes are uncomfortable. So when I said I couldn't stand you know, frilly dresses and tie. My, I was the only girl in a giant family of all boys, 32 cousins, and I'm the only female. <laughs> and I was the most masculine of all of them, but everybody was so happy to have a girl. They just ultra girled me and I couldn't, I couldn't stand wearing tights. I got put in ballet. I'm the, I'm the least ballet person in the world, but, um, so just say things out loud in front of your kid so that they start learning how to read. That's what co-regulation means. Yeah. You're helping to work yeah. through those things with them. Do that in front of your kid. It will help so much. Yeah. And I think even if they can't verbalize it, you're still helping them form an inner voice and a better understanding of themselves. That even they can't realizing like oh this is what I need to or you know like you're you're normalizing you know the experience of just being who you are and it being fine and good and you know brilliant um I want to thank you both so much I you are both amazing and doing fantastic work with neuroclastic I'm so incredibly grateful that you give so many people a platform. You give us such good information for, you know, parents who are trying to better understand their kids and who want to be, you know, more understanding and just better. And like, I know personally, like I, I want to be an ally, like so badly to all of you. And so I'm, you know, I feel like I'm on this like lifetime trajectory of learning. And like, I still have so far to go, but I'm like, I, I just love seeing organizations, um, like yours that are 
spearheaded by autistic people for autistic people. And like, as a parent who like, didn't know any of this before, like, I'm just, it like, just warms my heart so much because I feel like, like you all really are making a better world for the next generation. And um, I just don't think that can be overstated. So um, thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you to Kate. I asked Kate at the last minute to join. And uh, <laughs> so sorry, I, I did speak more than Kate. Um, but Kate was just being my executive function support friend um, by <laughs> doing this for me. And so thank you, uh, Kate, for that. And thank you to the audience and yes, and, and Jay Ace. Of for course. Having. And just so everyone knows, on the replay, you might not.